Happy Sabbath. It's good to be here. Last official Sabbath, unfortunately, to be here, but I've thoroughly enjoyed the four years that we have had with you. Um, they have been truly delightful years, and I know as a, as a Christian I've grown, and um, thank you for your ministry. Uh, I will be here on the 15th of February, um, because we have a very important date on the 15th of February. Uh, there will be a baptism um, taking place, not sure whether it'll be here in the church or down the ocean in the afternoon, but on February 15, Ikkyo, Hugo and Milo will be being baptised. So uh, please make sure you're here uh, for, that, for that beautiful day. Just something you know, funny about a sun, sunrise and a sunset. My sister-in-law, they lived in Perth, and they were down at the, the beach early one morning looking at this fantastic sunset, there was my, my sister-in-law, my brother, and there were a few other people um, just standing next door to Joan, and they were admiring this magnificent sunset. And without thinking, Joan just, talked, Joan just turned to the people next to them and said, look, it's so beautiful, I think I'll come back and see the sunset this afternoon. She forgot that the sun sets on the other side of the world and that she would have to go to a very different place, but... Yeah, you, you get caught up in the moment, don't you? And uh, it's truly a delightful thing. Um, today, I, I want to talk, and, and perhaps um, I've saved the best to last um, in my sermon presentations here. I do hope to come back and present it sometime in the future. But in my tenure here, I, I hope I've, I've saved the best to last. It wasn't intentional. Um, but over the last couple of months, um, it's, it's interesting as you study and you spend time in God's word, how something all of a sudden stands out. And it becomes head and shoulders above everything else. And, and you just have those, those fuzzy feelings about, wow, that's, that's beautiful stuff. And it's powerful stuff. And, and over the last few months, I've, I've come to that place where I've realized something very, very significant. And as a result, I asked myself the question, what are the most important words in Scripture? What are the most important words in Scripture? What are the most important three words in Scripture? Now that, that really narrows it down. And as I've asked many people, the most common one is Jesus saves. Well, that's a powerful one, that, that, that fact that Jesus saves. But that comes in late in the story. The biblical story is a very ancient story. And the fact that Jesus saves is, is, is well, well down in the story. It's, it's closer to the end. You know, the world is 4,000 years old when Jesus comes to save. So what are the most significant words in Scripture? Well, I want to introduce you to them by looking at two texts. And one text is about God, and one text is about Jesus. And as we then go through Scripture, you will see how the, the, the most important phrase that I believe in Scripture fits both, God and Jesus. And I want you to come to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. You ready? This says something beautiful, something powerful, something amazing. There is a passage in Scripture just not long after this where it tells us that God is love. And that's beautiful that God is love. But before we could see how God is love, we had to be able to see. And so look at 1 John 1 verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. What message is it that John, the beloved, wants to share with us? What is the most important message that his disciples 
wanted to share with the world. Here it comes. Here it comes. God is light. Wow. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him no darkness at all. Wow. Wow. Powerful, isn't it? God is light. Have you ever thought about that being a significant message before? Well, let's have a look at the next one. Let's have a look at the next one. Besides, I've got notes today, folks. That's it. Okay? That's it. That's my notes. Let's go to John 8. John 8, verse 12. It's interesting that it's John, the disciple John, the beloved, that has more to say about light than any other of the gospel writers. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, we have Jesus speaking. We have Jesus speaking, and he says, this is what he says. Oh. Where is it? Here it is. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, what does he say? I am the light of the world. So John the Beloved, when he is referencing God, says God is light. And then when Jesus introduces himself to this group of people, he says, I am the light of the world. Wow. What a bold statement to make, the light of this world. And we're going to look at two passages in Scripture now which reinforce both these statements so powerfully that it just blew my mind when I came to the realisation of what this all meant. So Jesus, John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall what? Not walk in darkness. Yeah. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. Wow, powerful, isn't it? But have the light of life. So the first thing that we learn from Scripture is the significance of light. Light is life. Without light, there is no life. Come to the first of the two references of Scripture that I believe are the most important words in Scripture. Come to Genesis chapter 1. You may have heard me talk briefly about this in the past in a different context. You may have heard me talk about the other passage in the past in a different context, but I'm going to lock them together today, and I think I'm going to blow your mind with what I share with you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. There it is. They are the most important words in Scripture. For if there was no beginning, there's nothing. There's not us. There's not anything. So in the beginning, because it was God's will, he did something. In the beginning, God chose at some point, at some time, to give us a beginning. And in the beginning, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, how did he create the, big, the creation story starts in verse 3. Yes, in verse 2, we've got the earth without form and we've got it with void. We've got darkness existing. We don't have light. We don't have light, we have darkness. And without darkness, nothing can exist. Nothing can live. It's a hopeless situation. And this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, it was without form, it was without void, and the Spirit of God was there. And then God said something. He said, let there be light. The most essential element to our existence, to our world, is light. Without light, there is nothing. 
there is nothing, nothing at all. And so God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yeah. Lyndon mentioned the, light, the sun being the light. Well, that's only the light that rules the day. It's not the light that rules the universe. It's the separation that God put into place. As he made the firmament, he filled the, the space of, the, of heaven with light, not, not sun. He didn't do that till the third day. Sorry, the fourth day. He put the sun in its place. Then, but prior to that, he had to create the space of light. He had to separate darkness and he had to create this great space where there would be light, where he could put life. And only because light was there could he put life in there. And then for the first three days of creation, he creates the different spheres. He creates the sphere of light. He creates the sphere of water. He creates the sphere of earth. And then the next three days, he fills the sphere of light. The next day, he fills the sphere of water. And then he, on the sixth day, he fills the sphere of earth. And they can all exist because they're in the presence of light. They're in, a pre they are in the presence of a God who is light. And so when the scripture says, and God said there, let there be light, because John 1, 1 John 1, 5, or 12 was it? 5, is saying God is light. What God is saying when he is saying, let there be light, he is saying, let there be myself. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That God... For all that he is, wanted there to be a place where he was, where we could be. So when we are dwelling in the presence of the created world in light, we are dwelling in the presence of God. Beautiful, isn't it? That God loved us so much that he wanted this place, this place of light, where darkness could not have dominion and we could see the amazing, beautiful God. And so what did he call this light? Look at verse 4. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided light from darkness. God called the light day. And he called, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day of creation. The most important thing for God to do when he made this world was to give light. And so that we as a people could live, as we as a people could exist, the rest of creation as he put it in place could exist. The trees could only live in light. All of the elements of the earth could only live in light. Adam and Eve would live in light and it was a beautiful place that God had made in the beginning God created. This place that was without form, this place that was void, this place that was darkness came alive because God stepped into it. He himself, the God of light, gave life and energy to our universe. And so we have this dwelling presence of God. This being that is light, we have this dwelling presence of God in our universe, controlling our universe, giving our universe hope, certainty, direction, purpose. Without light, there was no purpose. This world could not exist. And so it was not until he came down that he gave the great light and the sun to rule that day. Now I want you to come to the next passage of scripture. 
So there we have a picture of God, creation, light. I want you to come now to John, the book of John. Because something happened to that place of light. Something sad happened to that place of light. God had put Adam and Eve in the universe. He had created them. He had given the beauty of a beautiful world. But we know that in Genesis chapter 3, something happened. Although there was light, there became the dwelling of darkness. For evil came into that world. Into that beautiful light which God had created, into that beautiful world in which God created, it became consumed again by darkness. And it falls into sin. And sin is evil, sin is darkness. Sin causes separation from God. When we look into the Genesis story, in the cool of the evening, we are told that God would come down. That shrouding light was a protective covering for Adam and Eve. And while they had that light covering them, the presence of God, God could come in the cool of the evening and God could walk through the garden with them and God could communicate because the light of God was there. But sadly, sadly because the first couple chose to be tempted and allowed them to be distracted from the light of God, they consumed the forbidden fruit and darkness came. The glorious light that had given Adam and Eve protection was removed. And God that afternoon came to the Garden of Eden and he had to say, Adam, where art thou? Because of the darkness that had come over them, they had separated themselves from God and so that man could live. Even though now in darkness in that place of light, that God created so that man could live. God chose to separate himself from his creation and go back to where he could dwell without causing the death of his human family. And so now, yes, we have light. We still have light. We still have this created world, but the world is living in darkness. And the darkness, we are told, completely shrouded the earth. And the darkness was consuming the people and there was great evil and great wickedness happening until something happens. Come to John, John chapter 1. And so here now you have the very same phrase repeated as was given in Genesis 1. In the beginning. Wow. Wow. In the beginning. Yeah. These two phrases fit together. Because why? Well, when we come into the Gospel of John, when we come into the Word of God, after sin enters the world, we find that the world is in darkness. The world is in lostness. The world is without hope. It's gone. The world... God's created world has gone back to being one without form and void. It's not committed to God. It's being controlled by the evil one who was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. But sadly, the one who wanted to be like God could not bring light to this world because only God is light. And so when Lucifer came down to this world, even though he was the bright and shining star, even though he had the glory of God, when he came and came down to this world, he came in darkness. And darkness engulfs this world. It's not what God made it. It's a very different place to what God made it. And so it says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this God, who back there in the beginning of creation brought light to this world, comes again. 
comes again. The Word is God. This, this, this Jesus we talk about in John 1 is the, Jesus, is the God we talk about in Genesis 1. This God, this holy being, comes again into a world of darkness. Why does he come again into the world of darkness? Because he must do something. Let's carry on. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. So this, this Jesus that we're being introduced here in John 1 has already been the being of Genesis 1. He was with God. He was with there when he, he separated the darkness. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Here we are. This Jesus of John 1 is the one who made all things back then who in six days created the world, but first of all brought light. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was what? What does Jesus become when he becomes a human? What does Jesus become when he was born in the manger? He becomes the light of the world. Wow. Why? Because we're in darkness. We are in sin. We're not in the perfect place of the Garden of Eden. No, we're in a corrupt, wicked, sinful world that is dark, that is dying, that is being destroyed, and that world needed hope. So 4,000 years after the big event of God bringing light into this world, he comes again to bring light to the world. Light, the light of God. And it says, and the light shines where? In darkness. Jesus, my friends, is shining in darkness. Yeah, the world was lost. The world was hopeless. The world was in a dark, desperate place. And so the, the creator who knew that light was so essential to the existence of life at creation, knows again that it's only light that can save us. It's the light of the glory of the gospel and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The light shines in darkness, and what does it say? And the darkness did not comprehend it. Wow. That is the sin of the universe. That is the sin of the people. To not recognize that Jesus Christ is the saving light of the world. And without that realization that we need Jesus to find our way through darkness, we stay in darkness. We stay in sin. We stay in a sinful environment. We stay without hope. And that's why the book of Galatians says, in the fullness of time, Christ came. Yeah, at the darkest moment in the history of the world, Jesus came. Jesus was born. Jesus lived a sinless life. For three and a half years, he lived in ministry, teaching the disciples the things that they would need to teach the world. And he taught them light. He gave them the knowledge of salvation. Let's read on what John the Baptist had to say about this light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. John the Baptist was not that light but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light who gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, 
to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but of God. Yeah, God came. God created this world. He filled this world with light so that we could live. Sin came. Darkness invaded the space of God, overwhelmed the created universe, took the university on a journey that was not God's intention, but God in his love and mercy became light again. 2,000 years ago, the babe of Bethlehem became the light of the universe to show us the way back to God. Back to God. And what a majestic event that was. The angels of God turned up to declare that the glory of God had come. They spoke to the, to the shepherds in the fields. Glory to God in the highest. Yeah, for the light has come. The light has come. Wow. When you look at the scripture and the way that it is put together, the value of Jesus just goes through the roof when you understand this concept that without him, we are lost. We are in darkness we cannot find our way to God. And the way that the, the scriptures labors that point is powerful. Light was the most essential element to the existence of our planet when God created it. Jesus has become that same thing today. Jesus has to be seen in that same light that without him we do have nothing. We have no existence. We are unable to dwell in the presence of God. We're unable to be what God wants us to be. Oh man, this is, this is, this is just powerful, powerful stuff that we have. So yes, 1 John 1.5, God is light. John 8.12, Jesus is the light of the world. And so when he said that to, to, these, to his followers, let's have a little bit, little closer look at what he actually said in John 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In what context did Jesus say those words? Well, he said them to a lady. He said them in the, in the presence of a woman being condemned to death. Let's read the full story. John chapter 8 verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and when they had set her in their midst they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Okay, And then he says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, who is without sin among you? Let him throw the first stone. Wow. 
This is Jesus here is making a wonderful statement. Who needs light in this world? Those people out there? No, we do too. There is not one person in this planet who is not in darkness. There is not one person alive on this earth that does not need the light of God. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating here. These people, self-righteous individuals, have put themselves above the law and have found this lady. And they've brought her to Jesus and saying, look, this lady, she's in darkness, she's in sin. We have the right to kill her. We have the right to destroy her. She's a blemish on society. She should not live. And then Jesus, Jesus does this. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. There were no stones thrown that day. I wonder why. I wonder why. Because as Jesus wrote in the sand, he wrote the sins of each individual. And they could see that they themselves were in darkness. And they were separated from God. And so verse 8 says, Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, Hey, he's writing, but they heard it. So first of all he heard, they heard their statement, but they again hear this, the writing in the sand speaking to them. Being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in their midst. Wow. In this story, it's only the woman that embraces the light. All the rest walk away. They don't allow the glory and the light of Jesus to touch their lives. They leave in darkness. They leave in sin. Who didn't? It's the woman that stayed there. It's the woman that they believed should be stoned is the one that received the light of God. Verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's the beginning of the transformation of Mary Magdalene. Yeah, yeah. She received the light of God. She received the salvation power of Jesus. Oh, some six times after this, he still casts the demons out of her, but she's on the road. She's on the way to knowing Jesus because he became the light of her life and he transformed her life. And it's some three years later, thereabouts that Mary does the most beautiful thing of any human being she anointed Jesus she broke all cultural boundaries she broke all customs she defied all laws she sat at the feet of Jesus and she broke that alabaster jar of oil upon the feet of Jesus why? Because she accepted the light that Jesus offered her. 2020 is going to be the best year of your life if you allow that light to be in your life. It's going to be the best year you'll ever have if you allow Jesus Christ 
to be the light of your life, to light up your world, to light up your existence, to show you direction, to bring you out of darkness into his glorious and marvellous light. So in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And then when Jesus is talking to his people, he says, I am the light of the world. Yes. We need them both, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and we need the Holy Spirit who was commissioned to grow that light in our life. I just pray that, yeah, you will embrace the light of the world, Jesus Christ. We are, as Christians, privileged people. There is no doubt about that. To understand the saving plan of the, sal of the salvation of human life, but to know that God and Jesus can deliver all that they promise because of who they are, the controller of light, the giver of light. And because of that, the sustainer of a created world, but the saviour of a sinner, all because they are light. May God bless you, everyone, on your journey. May the light be bright for you all in 2020. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to have your word, to have your word written in such a way that it truly declares the magnificence of who you are. Yes, we've always looked at God as love and we've tried to unpackage that. But we thank you today that we've spent time at trying to understand what it means when it says God is light. Because you are light, there can be life. We can live. We can enjoy your beautiful created world. But because of sin, we lost the beautiful privilege of of having that without it being contaminated. And we thank you that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus stepped back into this world and gave us back the glorious light of God. Thank you that we have that privilege and may we embrace it and may we, dear Lord, be excited to know that darkness need not be a part of our life because we have the full light of the glory of God. And I pray this will be our blessing in 2020. In Jesus' name, amen.